the Australian Defence Magazine podcast. Serving the business of defence. With Grant McHeron. This episode is brought to you by Lockheed Martin Australia. When millions of people are counting on you, you can count on us. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the show. This episode, I'll be chatting with Stuart Wilson, aviation historian and author, and we're going to be looking back at the Royal Australian Air Force's history with information to supplement Stuart's article in the November issue of Australian Defence Magazine. Stuart, welcome to the show. Thank you, Grant. Very good to be here. Fantastic. Now, mate, for those few who may not know you um, in our audience, do you want to tell us about yourself and the uh, many books and articles and magazines and so on you've produced? Well, it's been a long story. Um, Basically, I regard myself as an aviation enthusiast who just happens to know how to string a few words together in approximately the right order most of the time. Uh, (laughs) We've got a nice collection of books we've done over the years, up to 64 so far, most of them aviation. Um, God knows how many articles for magazines, probably thousands. And... um, We've published a few books ourselves. Some have been published by other people. I think um, I need to mention that probably I'm pretty well known for the In Australian Service series of books that were published by uh, Jim Thorne and Aerospace Aerospace Publications from 1988 onwards. The uh, 13 books, three aircraft in each one of similar type and uh, four in the last one, so 40 aircraft altogether, and they became and remain pretty much a standard reference for um, those aircraft and RAF history. I'm quite proud of them, and I have to say that they probably made my reputation. They certainly did, and uh, there's a lot of us who either have them or know them. But, uh, mate, you also were responsible for producing and publishing the Aero magazine. Yes, Aero Aero Australia between... uh, 2003 and the, we did the last issue on the uh, January 2020. It was a shame it had to stop. It was uh, quite sad, actually, but it had to stop simply because uh, of health reasons, basically. There was only the two of us, me and my wife, Wendy, and it was all becoming a bit too much. And when we announced its closure, I had grown men in tears on the telephone. They, 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 were, they missed the magazine so much, and I was still getting similar reports about, you know, when can you start the magazine again? Well, unfortunately, it's not going to happen. But I think for, what was it, 17 years, 16 years, we produced an excellent aviation magazine. Certainly the people who bought it liked it, and that's the main thing, isn't it? Oh, definitely, and I'm one of those people. Uh, Moving on from your writings and publications, while we're in the RAAF centenary year, it is actually older than 100 years and started flying at Point Cook well before it became the Australian Air Force or even the Royal Australian Air Force. So can you tell us about its start at Point Cook and the history of Point Cook since then? Well, Point Cook, of course, is regarded as the cradle of Australian military aviation, and quite correctly too, well before the Royal Australian Air Force was established, as you mentioned, um, military flying started in 1914 at Point Cook with a couple of people and a couple of aeroplanes, including a Bristol box kite, and it was very much a matter of sussing it out to see if it was feasible in those days. And it proved to be, and gradually the idea grew, and uh, Point Cook became the centre of military flying for a number of years after that. And, of course, after that we um, progressed to the establishment of the Australian Flying Corps, which was controlled by the Army. And uh, like most uh, air forces or air arms around the world, they started off with the, with the Army running them. And um, the Australian Flying Corps went on to become the only Commonwealth air arm that uh, served in the First World War, which in itself is quite significant. Point Cook, meanwhile, continued to become the major base. In fact, it was the only base for a few years. Flying training school established there, the Central Flying School established there. And um, it was very heavily used in the Second World War, one service flying training school based there for various uh, training activities and what have you, and continued until 1992 as a major training base for what was then the the Royal Australian Air Force. And um, it's interesting to note that the very last training course in 1992 was for Army aviators, not Air Force up. Aviators, so full circle back to square one. Of course, Point Cook came under threat after that. 
it wanted to be sold off as a no longer needed military establishment, although the RAAF Museum, of course, was based there by then. And uh, there was a quite a strong campaign uh, launched by various people and organisations to keep Point Cook. One of the problems with Point Cook was, of course, the encroachment of suburbia around it, and it was seen as an ideal place to continue that. We had houses being built right up to the perimeter and all the rest of it. And, of course, naturally, some of the residents started complaining about aircraft noise and what have you. Isn't it funny how people move to near airports and aerodromes knowing it's there and then immediately start complaining about the noise? It's <laughs> yeah. something that's always... You do have to scratch your head. Yeah, there's something that's always intrigued me. However, the campaign to save Point Cook was successful because it was recognised as being an extremely important part of Australian, not just military history, but Australian history generally. So the aerodrome is still there, the RAF Museum is still there, and, of course, the RAF Museum aircraft, the airworthy aircraft, still fly from there. So that was quite a huge thing that it got saved because it was such a significant or is such a significant part of Australian history. And not just Australian. I believe it's the oldest continuously operating military airbase in the world. That is true, and it's now, what, 107 years old. And that in itself is something quite significant, isn't it? Indeed, and they're doing a lot of renovations to it because, of course, the other part of, of RAF Williams uh, at Laverton, that's long gone as an airbase. It's still military, but it, the, the runways are long gone and it's all uh, housing and, and so on all around it now. So keeping Point Cook is vital. Absolutely, for all sorts of reasons. And uh, the historic value of it is something that can't be quantified, isn't it? It's not something you can put a dollar price on. It's It's one of those things that, is just so important and it's priceless in effect. Very true. And you've mentioned the RAAF Museum that's there with their static and flying exhibitions. But uh, can you tell us a little bit about some of the other heritage organisations such as the Tamora Aviation Museum and 100 Squadron? Well, the Tamora Aviation Museum was formed by David Lowy um, 21 years ago as a purely private thing. And it, 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 he was looking for a place where he could fly his aeroplanes. And then the idea of a museum developed and uh, to honour uh, those who served as much as anything else because David has a very strong sense of history. And as you know, it grew very, very quickly and uh, lots of really interesting aircraft were added to the collection, Spitfires and the world's only airworthy Hudson and uh, Boomerang and various other things. But David was concerned about its future So in 2019, it was announced, and this is after a considerable amount of work, I hasten to add, that he would donate almost the entire fleet of aircraft to the nation, to the RAAF, in effect. And this tied in very nicely with the RAF 100 in 2021. And RAF Heritage established 100 Squadron to operate the Tamora aircraft, and they remain at Tamora and are operated and maintained by the Tamora staff, but they are now part of the RAAF. That in conjunction with the uh, Point Cook RAF Museum aircraft, they established 100 Squadron, which was appropriate for the centenary of the RAF, and also 100 Squadron was a um, a real squadron in World War II. It operated Beauforts. So we now have a situation where we have a wonderful collection of historic aircraft now entirely owned by the nation and largely thanks to, to uh, David Lowy's generosity. David Lowy was concerned about the continuity of the museum and the collection of aircraft and succession. And that is why he approached the Air Force and the government about donating those aircraft to the nation. The result is that the aircraft are saved, their future is assured, and we now have a wonderful collection of historic aircraft, probably more than just about any other nation in the world owned by the people. Uh, And uh, some of the aircraft are unique, like the only airworthy Hudson, for example. Yeah, and the Canberra, which just recently reflew. Yeah, it reflew, reflew uh, a couple of months ago after 11 years out of the air. It's amazing, isn't it? It's, and it doesn't seem that long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it did for those of us who were keeping an eye on it. But, um, <laughs> so I was fortunate to be there when it uh, reflew um, with uh, Darren Crabb, um, who was flying it, who's an ex-Royal uh, Canadian Air Force and Royal Australian Air Force Hornet pilot, now flies um, Gulfstream biz jets around the world, and uh, the former Chief of the Defence Force and Chief of Air Force Mark Binskin, 
will be the Canberra's display pilot, and he flew it uh, for the first time on the day after uh, Darren Crabb did. Very, very significant event. Let's take it back. We've talked about Point Cook and we've talked about the heritage being maintained, but let's go back to that heritage. Your article mentions some of the famous pilots of World War One that have become major names like Kingsford Smith, Hinkler, Taylor, and of course, uh, Williams, who went on to become known as the father of the RAAF, very in- in- influential and instrumental in getting it up and running. So were there any others who went on to greatness within the RAAF who came out of the AFC? Well, there was quite a few who uh, made a name for themselves, but one in particular stands out, and that's um, Arthur Henry Cobby, known as Harry Cobby, DSO, DFC in two bars. He was the the AFC's top-scoring fighter ace of the First World War. He shot down 29 enemy aircraft plus 13 of those observation balloons. And he went on to, he remained in the Air Force and ended up uh, still serving through World War II, not in a flying role, obviously, and reti- retired as an Air Commodore. And he is one of the more significant um, people, apart from those other famous names that came out of the Australian Flying Corps in World War I. So moving on from World War I, we move into the 20s and 30s, and that was not a great period for the RAAF. There were safety issues, funding issues, manpower issues, but they did manage an amazing survey of the entire country's coastline, and back then, sending a couple of aircraft around the whole country was a pretty major effort. Well, we need to go back a little further than that too because uh, there was a a gap between the uh, end of the Australian Flying Corps and the formation of the Australian Air Force on the 31st of March 1921. The Royal Warrant was issued by King George V a couple of months later. We had a situation where there were a lot of aeroplanes but not so many people. The British gave us an imperial gift of 128 aircraft after the First World War, which was to thank us for our service. A lot of those were not in very good condition, unfortunately, but at least gave a a start to things. There were SE-5s and DH-9s and Navarro 504s and things like that. The Royal Australian Air Force, its early operations were, as you mentioned, a lot of them were to do with survey flying and what have you, and there was um, Ferry 3D flying boats, one of those that we had actually under the operated by the Navy, surveyed the entire coastline, the Australian coastline in 1924, with the intention of being able to do some defence planning. And in fact, survey survey flights generally were a very important part of the RAF's duties during the 1920s, when the very new Royal Australian Air Force was uh, finding its feet. Interesting. It was certainly a major effort in logistics at the time. (laughs) It was uh, very barren around the uh, top end, especially. Well, it still is, but you can imagine uh, what an effort in logistics it would have been uh, 100 years ago, nearly. It would have been uh, very, very difficult for everybody involved because there were no proper, even (laughs) proper towns established in a lot of the places they went to. Uh, And certainly no navigation aids. There was no such thing in those days. Plus, uh, lines of support and getting spare parts and uh, even accommodating people. It, it, it was a, an enormous undertaking and very successful too. So speaking uh, in the time of the 20s, another major item that occurred there was the Salmond Report. Are you able to talk about the instigation for and the person and what happened there and what the results were? This was hugely significant for the future of the Royal Australian Air Force In 1928, a Royal Air Force senior officer, Air Chief Marshal John Salmon, was commissioned to do a report on the RAAF and its future, where it might go, where it should go, in fact. And it was very, very detailed and actually very, very good. And an interesting point about that was that he made the point that Darwin would be an extremely significant strategic port and airbase in the future which nobody had really thought about up until then. And, of course, events later on proved him to be absolutely correct. Unfortunately, the Great Depression hit. The RAAF, in fact, struggled to survive. It, it looked like it was going to be disbanded there for a while because there was simply no money. So Salmon's report was put into a drawer and forgotten about for a while until 1934 when things were a little better. They were looking at building up the RAAF a bit more, so they dusted off Salmon's report and applied much of its principles to the expansion of the RAAF in the second half of the 30s, which, again, was probably just as well because we know 
about the rumblings that were going on in Europe, and uh, we know what happened in 1939. So Salmon Report was very, very important to the RAF's history. Indeed. So we've come out of the Salmon Report. They've started acting on it. The 30s are happening, as you said, the rumblings, and then the actual event from 39 onwards. So let's talk about World War II and how Australia didn't really have a lot of great aircraft for the types of opposition they were going up against, and how the United States and the United Kingdom helped Australia by supplying aircraft. At the end of the day, Australia didn't really have much to fight with in 1939, despite the expansion. Most of the aircraft that they'd uh, acquired were general purpose types, uh, you know, the Hawker Demons, Western Whoppities, aeroplanes like that. Um, the uh, locally built Wirraway came along later in the 30s. We didn't have any real combat aircraft. But when the war with Germany started, uh, we were able to send crews and pilots over to the the Middle East originally and then to Europe. But Australia was pretty much undefended and our pilots flew mainly with Royal Air Force squadrons. By the time Japan entered the war in December 1941, we were in trouble because we were seriously under threat of invasion for quite some time and we all know how quickly the Japanese advanced through through Southeast Asia and into New Guinea and, of course, in February 1942, bombed Darwin for the first time. We didn't have any fighters. The Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation had designed and built the Boomerang fighter in very, very short time because there were concerns that there wouldn't be any fighters coming from overseas. Um, it, it proved to be not the world's greatest fighter, <laughs> but uh, it found its niche, niche later on in um, – in New Guinea doing uh, army cooperation, target marking, stuff like that. The Americans sent us P-40 Kitty Hawks, thankfully, and then a little later the British sent us Spitfires, so we had squadrons of fighters to defend the nation. But it was um, very, very much a, a ragtag Royal Australian Air Force up until then with lots of general purpose types but uh, no real fighters. Thankfully, that situation resolved itself both from overseas sources and also from uh, local production. Yeah, you did mention the Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation, who uh, they they looked at the North American NA-16, which was the precursor to the T-6 Harvard in the USA, and uh, Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation licensed the NA-16 for production here in Australia, where it became the Wiraway, as you mentioned. So Australian industry, it was slowly ramping up at about that time for military aviation. But uh, as you mentioned, there was more than just sending aircraft, wasn't there? uh, The um, UK sent us plans and everything to be able to build our own versions of their aircraft. Yeah, but a lot of the um, tooling and what have you had to be made locally rather than imported because of uh, concerns about submarine sinking ships and what have you. The establishment of an Australian aircraft industry in earnest, started in 1936 with the establishment of the Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation, CAC, privately owned by a group of industrialists who saw that we were going to need to have that capability because of the gathering walk clouds in Europe and elsewhere. So as you said, their first product was the actually a NA-16 2K, which was a retractable undercarriage version of the early versions of the aircraft that became the, the uh, Harvard, as you mentioned. So that was very significant in itself. And, of course, CAC went on to build a boomerang and um, later on Mustangs and various other aircraft post-war as well. The biggest thing that happened was the establishment of a government-owned Department of Aircraft Production, which mobilised a whole industry in Australia. We had factories, 600 factories around the country building bits for the Bristol Beaufort, which was being built under licence and two final assembly lines, one in Sydney and one in uh, in Melbourne. And you can't understate what a significant event this was. We went from basically nothing to everything in a very short space of time. It was a massive undertaking. And uh, we built 700 Beauforts, which were very, very uh, useful for the RAAF as, as a light bomber, very good aeroplane. Of course, we followed those up with um, 365 Bow fighters. Department of Aircraft Production became the government aircraft factories after the war and continued building aeroplanes, Lincolns, Canberras, what have you. CAC built Sabres after the war. Government aircraft factories, GAF, also, of course, as you know, built Hornets, which was the last uh, major combat aircraft that's 
uh, to be built in Australia. They were built under licence, weren't they? They were. Um, there was a high degree of and an increasing degree of Australian componentry in the aircraft as time went on, as had been the case in the 60s when the Mirage was built. Um, GAF was responsible for the program. Uh, CAC built the wings. So we had all these quite advanced aircraft being built in Australia up until basically the last Hornet rolled out in the early 90s. Um, we built Hawks, of course, as well. After that, the um, lead-in fighter trainer and PC-9 turboprop trainers. But basically, there's been nothing since then. And I think that it's unlikely we're going to be building those sorts of aircraft in Australia again, unfortunately. Yeah, it's, it's, it's becoming a topical issue um, recently with the sovereign industry and so on. But uh, yeah, we, we certainly had that sovereign industry here and let it go, unfortunately. But these things happen. I think the reality of the situation is that we are going to be more dependent on just buying stuff, particularly from America now. And I think that's the way of the world. I, I don't think we're going to be in a position to build Hornets or advanced combat aircraft again. I think the reality is we're just going to have to buy them. And hopefully we have sufficient industry strength to properly maintain, support them and maybe build bits for them to keep them going. Indeed. And it's it's mostly the support industry that we need now. And you're quite right. We're not going to be in a position to fund and develop anything so major as uh, like we have with our current platforms. You're listening to the Australian Defence Magazine podcast, and we'll be right back after this message. Securing Australia's national interests is a partnership. That's why at Lockheed Martin Australia, we work with the Australian Defence Force to deter and defend against strategic threats while strengthening our country from within. For more than 70 years, we have contributed to Australia's security and prosperity engaging in the integration and sustainment of advanced technology systems, products and services across space, air, land, sea and cyber domains. And by delivering unmatched capabilities through sovereign partnerships, we aim to further a culture of innovation for generations to come. Lockheed Martin Australia, your mission is ours. And now, let's get back to the Australian Defence Magazine podcast. Let's roll back back into World War II. Uh, World War II did see Australia contributing strongly in all theatres and, of course, a heavy involvement in Bomber Command. But one interesting item that doesn't usually get quite as much uh, awareness was the uh, Sunderlands that Australia had purchased, and they wound up staying in England with their crews when war broke out. Are you able to talk a bit more about that? Well, as you know very many thousands of Australian air crew served with the uh, with Royal Air Force squadrons in, in England and Europe. And, of course, Australian squadrons were established to operate within the RAF as well. But the Sunderland story is quite funny in a strange sort of way because we had ordered the Sunderlands and the personnel from 10 Squadron were over in the UK in order to train on them, pick them up and bring them back to Australia when the war started. <laughs> and they were invited to stay, <laughs> which they did, and, and remained operating in the, the UK and Europe for the remainder of the war. And uh, they did uh, destroy some U-boats, part of their duties and various other things. So it was one of those accidents of history that happens every now and again. But uh, another squadron too, um, uh, 461 Squadron, RAAF, operating with the Royal Air Force, of course, uh, uh, was established a bit later and it also flew Sunderlands throughout the rest of the war or most of the rest of the war before returning to Australia. So that's, that was an unexpected little bit of um, history <laughs> that occurred. <laughs> yeah, that definitely was the case. And you mentioned 461 Squadron there. and that, they, The Commonwealth Squadrons, I believe they call them because they had Canadian ones, New Zealand ones, and the Australian ones were like 460, 461, 462 and, and so on. And at the end of the war, those squadron numbers were moved back to Australia, weren't they? Yeah, well, they were, um, and you mentioned the Canadian New Zealand as well, they were, for Australia, they were the, the Article 15 squadrons, they were called. They were the, the squadrons established in uh, as part of the RAF, but they were called RAAF squadrons, and they were the idea was to have predominantly Australian crews in them. There was always a mixture, but more Australians became involved as time went on, the same with the Canadians and the Kiwis as well. 
and um, they establish their own little uh, niche, if you like. But, of course, you can't forget that many, many other Australian airmen served with regular Royal Air Force squadrons as well. And we had an awful lot of them over there. And they were mainly the result of a wonderful thing called the Empire Air Training Scheme, which was established to provide air crews for the Royal Air Force. And we had training establishments in Australia. There were establishments in Canada, New Zealand, and other Commonwealth places as well. It was a huge undertaking. And the good thing about Canada, Australia, and New Zealand was, of course, that uh, they could train their pilots away from the action. They weren't in any danger of being attacked while they were being trained, and that made a big difference. It certainly did. So coming back to the Pacific Theatre, which from Japan's entry, as you mentioned, in '41, led to a scrabble to uh, defend Australia, but also to push back against the Japanese. And I believe it was the defence of Port Moresby that where the Japanese encountered one of their first major blocks and problems in their advanced south. Yes, when they were at, uh, coming south through through New Guinea, um, the defence of Port Moresby was a desperate thing. Originally, we only had some Wirraways up there to uh, counter the Japanese air attacks, which, of course, Wirraway was no fighter. But gradually, P-40 Kitty Hawks started arriving and equipping the squadrons up there. They achieved the nickname the Never Hawks or the Tomorrow Hawks there for a while because <laughs> they were always promised but never turned up. But eventually they did. And... Um, some proper resistance was able to be offered to the against the Japanese, and of course that in combination with the troops on the ground, Milne Bay was a particularly important victory, an all Australian victory involving Air Force and Army, and I think Navy as well. And uh, the Battle of the Coral Sea was the first major reverse the Japanese suffered, and after that they were on the run. Yep, it all really changed from then. So they were on the run. They were being pushed back and pushed back. A lot of uh, American, British and Australian forces were pushing them back. But eventually the Australian forces were being sent out, not into frontline, but they were being sent to more secondary targets. And I believe that led to the uh, famous Moritai, well, notorious, shall we say, Moritai mutiny. Can you talk about that? The Moritai mutiny resulted from General MacArthur, who declined to allow Australian forces to accompany his forces northwards into the Philippines and to finish the job against the Japanese. Australia got as far as the Moritai Islands, the Air Force was there, and MacArthur would not allow anybody but Americans to be involved in the push from there onwards. I think it was an ego thing as much as anything. I think he thought he was, I think he thought he was Julius Caesar, but anyway, that's another story. So th th we found our, our fighter squadrons and other squadrons were basically doing mop, mopping up stuff at high risk. Losses were being incurred for no no gain, really, and this started to annoy the hell out of um, our people. They were particularly the fighter pilots. They were there to to fly and to, and to fight the enemy, but they weren't being allowed to. So we had the unprecedented situation where some senior officers, including Clive Corwell and Bobby Gibbs, famous aces, famous names, tried to resign from the Royal Australian Air Force. It's called a mutiny, but it's, mm, it's probably a, a, a newspaper headline description for it. And, of course, resigning in wartime is not something that you do. It's a very serious thing. And, of course, the then Chief of Air Force, George Jones, took a very dim view of that. Now, in parallel with that, there had been um, accusations that people like uh, um, Caldwell had been running booze into, <laughs> into the bases and what have you. Now, everybody was doing this anyway, but Jones was able to use that as the reason to discipline his uh, airmen. So Corville and others were reduced in rank and it rankled with Corville for his entire life, that particular situation. It wasn't good, but you can imagine you're, you're a, a leading fighter pilot and you're being told to basically shoot the jungle and you were still in danger of being shot down. Yeah, it was, it was all a risk with uh, no real benefit. Okay, so we've gone through World War II. Everyone's come out the other end. Uh, the 77th Squadron was in Japan as part of the occupation forces. And, in fact, they were, I believe, getting ready to go home and partway through a party when the word came through that the Korean war, well, the Korean police action had just started. Yes, there'd been several um, 
RAAF Mustang squadrons were in Japan as part of the British Occupation Force and uh, all the others had come home. And as you say, 77th Squadron was on the uh, on the verge of coming home when the Korean War started, so it was told to stay. So we had the situation where its Mustangs remained there and operating from both uh, Japan and Korea was, were involved in various mainly ground attack operations. And that was in 1950. In 1951, they swapped to Meteor Jets, which was a little historic too because it was the first time RAAF jets had been used in combat. And the 77th Squadron finally got to come home in 1953 after having been out of the country for 11 years, I think it was. That is a long stint. Yeah. Um, And, of course, they did very well in Korea as well. I believe they even managed to shoot down an aircraft or two, but given the Meteor was primarily, well, repurposed as a ground attack aircraft, that's pretty good going. Well, they found the Meteor was no match for the MiG-15s that were being flown by not only the North Koreans, but also Chinese pilots and Russian pilots as well. But we did manage to shoot down, I think, two confirmed MiGs, uh, George Hale, Sergeant George Hale, one of them, and uh, Bill Simmons, the other one. I think there's a possibility that Hale might have got another one as well, but certainly two. But as you say, they were used mainly for ground attack. They were outclassed as fighters against the MiGs. Yeah, that was certainly uh, certainly not up to the calibre of the MiGs, and especially if if there were uh, Russian pilots flying them, they they grew up with those aircraft, as you might say. Yeah, yeah. So after the Korean War, bit of peace. Then there was the Vietnam War, and I believe that's where Australia really got the reputation of punching above its weight and getting more done with less. That's certainly true, and uh, we had uh, thirty five squadrons uh, caribou over there nine squadrons Iroquois helicopters and, of course, two squadrons Canberra bombers. And the the uh, Caribou and the Canberras particularly did a job to punch well above their, their weight. The It was dangerous flying, talking about the Caribou, in and out of very rough strips, usually and often under fire, delivering people and stuff wherever they needed to go. And uh, several aircraft were destroyed while we were over there. The Canberra, um, of course, was technically obsolete, by the time of the Vietnam War and um, had already been replaced or about to be replaced by the F-111. But two squadron went over there and they did a a job which was certainly above and beyond. They were flying alongside an American American B-57s, which were the uh, American version of the Canberra, and their sortie rate and their success rate was well above that of the Americans. Um, We just got on with it, as we do. We rearmed the the Canberras with American 750-pound bombs instead of the usual British 500-pounders, a couple in the uh, Bombay and one hanging off each wingtip, and just as we do, got on with it, accurate bombing. And sadly, we lost two Canberras as well during the Vietnam War. So that between, as you mentioned, with the Caribou, the the famous Wallaby Airlines, that was started, I believe that was 35 Squadron started over there, but they were known under a different name, weren't they? There's a transport flight Vietnam was the uh, was the original name of it. It wasn't wasn't a squadron, and uh, then it got upgraded to uh, squadron status to 35 squadron Wallaby Airlines, as you say, as it became came known as, and uh, did a wonderful job. Actually, the Caribou was one of those aircraft, wasn't it, that we ordered in the 1960s and took delivery of in the 60s that did a marvellous job for the RAAF over the years. We got the first Orions then, the Caribou, ordered the F-111s, of course. They were all very, very good purchases. They certainly were, and the the, uh, Caribou certainly stuck around a very long time, much longer than anyone expected, I I would say. But you mentioned the F-111, and while so much has been covered on that, uh, it deserves podcasts of its own, a series of its own. There was an interesting part of that, which was the interim F-4 Phantoms. Well, of course, as we know, the F-111 was ordered in 1963 and delivery was supposed to start in 1968. And in fact, the 24 original uh, RAF F-111s had been built and were ready for delivery in 1968, but uh, there were some problems with the aeroplane, the American aeroplanes. There were fatigue problems and wing carry through box problems, structural issues which needed to be sorted out. So we delayed delivery of our F-111s until the problems sorted. We didn't get them until 1973. In the meantime, we needed an interim type to replace the Canberra, but also to give RAF air crews and ground crews experience on a modern supersonic um, fighter bomber. 
So 24 Phantoms, F4Es, were leased from the US Air Force between uh, 1970 and 72 for operation by numbers 1 and 6 squadrons, which were those which would be operating the 111. And it gave uh, the necessary experience. And in fact, the the Phantoms were very popular. There was some discussion about keeping them um, because they they were so good. But it would have meant disbanding one of the Mirage fighter squadrons in order to keep the Phantoms. So they went back to the USA. And most of them were converted to wild weasel electronic warfare aircraft and many of them saw action in the Gulf War later on. And those that survived uh, were turned into target drones and uh, shot down. Yeah, the sad fate of many aircraft. Yeah, but the Phantom was certainly one of the great combat aircraft of its era, no doubt about that. And, uh, yeah, the, the people who flew them loved it. Something that uh, we sort of touched on, uh, during Vietnam there was rotary. We had Huey helicopters over there. And at one point the RAAF had a rotary wing. It was the the Hueys, the Chinook, and then it was transferred to Army. Well, all the helicopters basically that we had were operated by the RAF for a time. A decision was made in the 80s to uh, give the Army all our rotary wing assets. Now, the RAF had operated... Chinooks, as you mentioned, that they were given away basically because somebody decided, some politician decided they were too expensive to operate and that the forthcoming Blackhawks would be able to do the same job, which of course proved to be totally incorrect. But anyway, the all the helicopter assets were handed over to the Army in 1989, I think it was, in 1990, and of course they still operate them today. Yep, and with the Hueys long retired, but the Blackhawks and now multiple other helicopters that they're operating. So we've gone through quite a bit of history. We're now in the present day. We've got a revitalised set of platforms, you might say, that it's an amazing time to be in or following the Royal Australian Air Force with uh, C-17, Super Hornets, Growlers, uh, C-27s. Oh, the list is endless, the E-7, the P-8, the F-35, the PC-21, et cetera. And, and we've got the Peregrine coming up very shortly. And of course, we've got the drones. There was experience flying the Heron while we we're in Afghanistan. And now we're going to the M- MQ-4C Triton and the MQ-9B Sky Guardian um, unmanned aerial systems. So do you want to make any comments on how you see the future going? Well, welcome to the future with unmanned aerial vehicles, but we're still going to need aeroplanes with pilots sitting in them and crew members sitting in them. I, I can't see a completely pilotless Royal Australian Air Force, certainly in my lifetime, which (laughs) which may not be all that much longer. (laughs) But um, I I think the the philosophy that we now have has grown really since the Hornet was introduced in the mid eighty. That was our first computerized electric aeroplane, if you want to put it that way. And that's where the current trend towards connected, uh, network centric assets being able to talk to each other, whether they be aeroplanes or whether they be ships or troops on the ground or even space assets, all that started to develop then. And that is where we're at now and it's where it's going to be in the future. Hopefully, we won't ever have a situation where we're going to test this to see if it works or not. But, you know, there are a few people around at the moment who are a little concerned about the peace of the future. So we'll see what happens. But certainly the RAAF is an extremely modern air force. Some of those um, platforms that you just mentioned, like Wedgetail and even the tankers and, uh, you know, some of those assets have been proven in combat already, already like the the tanker and the the Wedgetail and the Super Hornets over in uh, Syria and Iraq. So we know they work. What will be interesting from my point of view is to see how well they all work when there is some actual air opposition We've been very lucky so far. Most of the stuff we've done really since Korea has been in in a uh, situation of total air dominance. So hopefully we won't have to find out whether it works when we have serious opposition. Well, Stuart, this has been an amazing discussion on the history of the Royal Australian Air Force and its early days and then it becoming the RAF 100 years ago. So... Stuart, I understand you've uh, also, in addition to writing the article for uh, Australian Defence Magazine and coming on this episode, you've also produced an e-book on the uh, 100 years of the RAAF. Yeah, following the demise of Vero Australia, we decided we'd try to uh, produce some uh, downloadable e-books rather than going to print. So we did the first two, volumes one and two of Made in Australia, Aircraft Made in Australia, which is basically 
articles that were in Aero that we've updated and rejigged and what have you and offering as an ebook. But also we've done one on the um, on the RAF 100, which I'm quite pleased with. The Chief of Air Force uh, provided an introduction for it, which was very nice of him. And um, they're all available now. Uh, can, if I can put a plug in, go to aeroaustraliamag.com, click on the ebooks, and they're available through there. And uh, I'm quite pleased with them. They've, they've turned out very well, actually. So there you go. There's my free plug thrown in. <laughs> well, thanks, Stuart. I think you've earned that plug from sitting here and talking to me for so long. Uh, we started talking an hour before we hit the uh, go button, so it's been a good <laughs> chat. And I thank you very much for your time, Stuart. That's been fantastic. Oh, my pleasure. I hope there's something of use in there for you. <laughs> I'm sure the audience will enjoy it. This episode was brought to you by Lockheed Martin Australia. When millions of people are counting on you, you can count on us. The ADM podcast is produced by Southern Skies Media on behalf of Australian Defence Magazine, a Yaffa Media title. The views of the people appearing on this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Australian Defence Magazine, the Department of Defence or the guest's employer. If you wish to use any of the audio in this podcast, please contact Australian Defence Magazine via their website, australiandefence.com.au or via email at defmag at yaffa.com.au. You've been listening to a Yaffa Media Podcast. Southern Skies Media.